This morning, as I said, we are beginning a new series, um, and it's uh, entitled Proclaim. You see it on the front of your bulletin there. And what we're going to do over the next several weeks, four to five weeks, um, we're going to be talking about how you can become better equipped to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the beauties in basically having the opportunity to share Christ is when you really have a chance to, to come alongside of someone and you have a chance to, to have that conversation about do you want to accept Jesus in your life and you see an individual do that, uh, there's no greater feeling. It's, it, it's amazing. It's wonderful. When I uh, uh, was doing youth ministry, and I know I've shared this with you before, one of the, the neatest and, and most awesome experiences I ever had was one night after we were doing a weekend with a group of kids from inner city, Chicago, and, and Milwaukee, um, sharing the gospel message. And then after sharing that gospel message, is said, is there anyone who would like to accept Jesus in their lives? And we had about 25 kids from the ages of about 6 to 15 years old that came up and they kneeled in the very front of the church and they accepted Jesus Christ in their lives. And when we got done that evening, I just remember thinking, if this is a glimpse of what heaven is like, it's going to be amazing. I've never had an experience so wonderful as someone coming to know Christ. So there can be a lot of joy when we lead someone into that relationship with Christ. But on the flip side, I think sometimes there's a fear that we have in wanting to share the gospel with those that are around us. We become fearful of of how they're going to respond or what they're going to say or what they're going to do. And so that becomes part of the challenge as we look at this series about proclaiming and and about sharing that gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, for some people, it's very easy. Um, I know people that can just walk up to whomever it is and say, hey, let me tell you about Jesus, and and they start to do that. Next week, my son-in-law is going to be here, and he's very good at that. I mean, he's... I, I'm amazed by him being able to do that. It doesn't matter where he goes, he can always stir up a conversation with people about Jesus. I'm a lot more hesitant that way. In fact, at times I'm very almost fearful of that. And sometimes I think, why is that the case? You know, why, why am I fearful in that? I, re, I remember years ago we did a missions trip and we were going to go to the beach. We were in Florida doing daily vacation Bible school and we were going to go to the beach one day and one of our, our, our challenges is, is, hey, let's share Jesus, share Jesus with the people on the beach. And we thought we would do it in a way which would, would maybe open up a door. So we made these what we called salvation bracelets. Some of you back then probably remember them. They had the colored beads on them. And so what our strategy was is we'd walk up to someone, let's say Jenny's, Jenny's out on the beach here, and I'd say, hey, would you like a bracelet? It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. And if, if she was open to, to say, sure, then I'd give it to her and say, well, can I tell you what the colors mean? And it was a way to sort of introduce the gospel. And so we were asking the kids to do this, and I knew that one of the things was I was supposed to do that as well. And it was hard for me. It was hard for me to, to want to actually just go up to a stranger and, and, and share Jesus. And, and I sometimes think it's, it's hard for a lot of us that way. We, we have this fear, and, and it could be a fear that, that is created by several different things. Maybe, um, you know, the fear is, is, well, if I share with them, they're not going to like me. They're going to see me as, as someone different, or, oh, that's just one of those Christians. And, and so we don't want to expose ourselves that way. Or maybe there's this fear because we like to be successful, and we're afraid that if we share that gospel message, Someone's going to turn us down, and that doesn't create the success we're looking for, so we're better off not saying anything. Or maybe we just seem to be really good at things, and and again, that fear is is this is going to create failure within our lives. Or, Or we're worried about someone when we share our faith, maybe getting angry, or there's pushback, and and there's this resistance as as we're wanting to share. One of the fears that that people will deal with is, is, well, I don't know enough about the Bible. I I have that lack of knowledge, and I'm afraid that as soon as I 
talk to someone about Jesus, they're going to ask me, so tell me about the Trinity and what do you think of God? And I'm not going to have the answer. And so we're fearful to want to share because we're not sure how to respond. Or maybe we have this fear that as we talk to someone about Jesus, their mindset right away is, oh, that's one of those people. They're just trying to force their religion on me. They're trying to force on me what I should think and how I should believe. And so we, we have this fear. Now, as we go through this series, we are going to discover a couple things. Number one is, it's our job, it's, it's our call that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, 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 it's a, a commission, it's, it's, it's a, a command that Jesus has given to us, and so it's something that we need to do. But the beauty of it is, is, is God, through the scriptures, has also given us tools that will be able to help us in those conversations with another person. Maybe it'll help calm our fears and give us that courage that we need to not be afraid to talk to other people about who Jesus is. Part of what we deal with, I think, is, is what we see evangelism to be. It'd be interesting if I asked you, what do you see evangelism? If, if I was telling you, you need to go tell people about Jesus, what your answers would be. I think for some of us who are a little bit older, we maybe grew up in the church sort of hearing about evangelism, and we had this mindset maybe a little bit like the Jehovah's Witnesses where, uh, okay, people, you're going to leave this place today, and we're going to go walk door to door through the neighborhood, and you're going to knock on the door, and you're going to see if that person knows Jesus or not. You know, and that maybe is the perception we've had, or maybe it's, uh, you know, the perception of whenever you have that big event or activity, and it's like, Okay, we're going to go, we got the county fair coming up, um, we're going to get a whole bunch of religious tracts, and as you walk around for the day, just hand them out to whomever you want. And again, we have this image of, of that's what evangelism looks like. But the thing of it is, is when you really look at the scriptures, the Bible doesn't talk about the fact that we're supposed to go knocking door to door, or that we're supposed to necessarily be handing out religious tracts, although those things can make a difference. But the Bible gives us a different perspective on what it looks like to proclaim that gospel. And it begins sort of uh, in Matthew 28. This is before the scripture we're, we're talking about, which is the Great Commission today. In Matthew 28, 16 and 17, we read this. It says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had, them, had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So there's a couple things that are happening here. Uh, the disciples at this point knew that Jesus rose from the dead. They, they, they had witnessed what had taken place with his death and his resurrection. They were in an upper room trying to figure out what to do. And as they were there, Jesus appears to them. And then later on, Jesus says to them, I want you guys to gather on this mountain. I'm going to come and I'm going to meet up with you. And as Jesus goes, one of the, the things we see in this verse is they worshiped him. Now, it's sort of interesting because this is really sort of the first time that the disciples actually understood the full story because of what they had seen and what they had witnessed. And this is really the first time that they actually worshiped Jesus himself. Before that, when they were walking alongside of him, they saw him as this prophet. They saw him as this individual that was maybe going to change the world from a political standpoint. They weren't exactly sure how that was going to play out. And so when it came to that worship aspect, they weren't doing it yet at that point. But now as, as he meets with them on the mountain, we have these disciples who worship and understand fully who Jesus is. The second part of it is, is we see that it says some doubted. And we think, well, how could they doubt? You know, what was happening that, that they, they would doubt? I mean, after all, they, they spent three years of their lives with him, and, and they saw the miracles, and they, they saw and heard the message and his teachings, and they witnessed his his torture and they witnessed his death and and him being put into this grave and and they had an opportunity to witness his resurrection and and so we think why you know why is it that they doubted 
Now, there could be a couple reasons for that. One of them potentially is, is, you know, when they were with him, they saw him potentially more as this political leader where they figured he was going to become a ruler and maybe ultimately take over, over the world. And so now that it becomes a different picture, they're, they're maybe doubting because it's like, well, how do I respond to this? What am I supposed to do with this? The, the other idea that, that is potentially there is that you know, when Jesus rose, he not only showed himself to the disciples, but a lot of other people. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, it says, After that, he, who would be Jesus, appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom were still living, though some had fallen asleep. And so as he showed himself to more and more people as, as he rose, uh, there were maybe some of those who were thinking, did this really happen? Is, is this really real? Is this really taking place? Even us, when we, we talk about our relationship with Christ, I, I can say, do you believe in, in Christ? And do you believe in, in God's call upon your life and what he wants you to do? And you might be able to answer pretty confidently, yes, but yet at the same time, you know, and then it's like, okay, use your gifts for this or that. You know, God's, God's gifted you to sing. Why don't you use your gift? And then you become hesitant. It's like, I don't know if I want to do that. Or teaching, you know, maybe the call is to teach. And, and all of us become, well, maybe I don't know enough. And, and we become hesitant. So that hesitancy that the disciples had could be, you know, the same thing that we experience. But the thing of it is, is Jesus is there, and he's standing before him, and as they see him, and maybe as they're doubting, he speaks these words to them. And not only is he speaking those words to them, but he's speaking them to us. In Matthew 18, starting in verse 19, he says this. It's called the Great Commission. Most of you have probably heard it at one point or another. It says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus' call to us, his command to us, is that we are to go and make disciples. As we walk in a relationship with him, that's part of our responsibility. It's not an option. It doesn't say go if you want to. It doesn't say, just accept me in, in, into your life and you don't have to do anything else. When we walk in that relationship with Christ, there's a, there's a call, there's a command to go. And, and it's something that we're supposed to do. You know, it is said that 95% of Christians have never led someone to Jesus Christ. I'm shocked when, when, I, when I heard that, when I read that. Because you would think that's one of the things that we're supposed to do, and yet, why are we not doing it? And, and maybe the sad part about that is, is that there's probably, of that 90%, how many have not even told the story, have not even been willing to tell someone else about the beauty of, of who Jesus is and what he can do? So, as we are called to go, Jesus is trying to really emphasize to that. Uh, you know, usually if someone departs or leaves and they leave their last words with you, you're thinking they're probably pretty important. I better pay attention to them. Um, yeah, this is maybe a terrible illustration, but, you know, you always think of someone dying in the movies and, and as they're dying, you know, that person goes up and they whisper something to them and it's like, okay, whatever it is is going to have to be pretty important. And so as Jesus is with his disciples here on this mountain, he's speaking some of his last words to, him, to them, and he's trying to make it clear to them, these are important words. And as Jesus speaks, what does he say? He says, go and make disciples. Now, our thought maybe is, is that's scary. And we're maybe not quite sure what that looks like. Maybe that's part of the reason it's scary, because... Sometimes when we feel like we are called to go, Jesus is saying go, we're thinking we have to pick up whatever it is we have. And he's like, oh man, he's going to tell me to go to Africa. Or he's going to tell me to go to 
South America or he's going to tell me to go to Russia. Or, and, and, and we have this mindset that if we're going to follow his command to go, we have to pick up where we're at and go somewhere else to really make that happen. But that's really not the case. If you look at the word go and you break, break it back down to the ancient language in Greek, in Greek it really means having gone. Or maybe uh, another way to say that is the going aspect. And so when Jesus says go into the world, it's like going into the world. It, it's no longer I have to go halfway across the world to, to go, but it's going in my daily life. And so when you get up in the morning, you go places, whether it's to work or it's to school or it's hanging out with your friends or, uh, you know, going to the store or the restaurant or whatever. I mean, you're going. And so the beauty of this, this commission to go and make disciples is, is we don't have to go halfway across the world. God has given us opportunity every day for a chance to be able to share that gospel. And the challenge is, is are we going to grab hold of that? Are we going to take advantage of it? Or when those doors open up, we shut them somehow in some way. Yesterday I had a couple opportunities where I had a chance to present Jesus. And there was a side of me that says, I didn't want to do that. Maybe ashamedly admitting that. But yet I knew that part of my relationship with Jesus is that even at times when I don't want to and God is opening up that door for me to share that gospel, I need to. So, you know, it's like, all right, Lord, I guess you got a purpose and a reason for this. Um, I'm going to do it. Now, did I lead anyone to Christ yesterday? No. But... I feel confident that I was able to potentially plant seeds that someone else might water, and eventually God will bring those people to know Jesus. And the call is simply to go. As a church, we've been working hard, and we have this discipleship learning team that is looking at how we can grow you in your relationship with Christ to, to go out into the wor world and, and boldly speak it. And one of the things we did is we came up with a, a definition. It's hanging down the hall of our church. We're ultimately going to put it in our fellowship hall here. But we said, what is intentional discipleship? And you see the definition there. And it really relates to this whole Great Commission thing. Because it says, intentional discipleship is a person fully and completely committed to Jesus Christ, and it is reflected by. So it first talks about this deep relationship we have for Jesus Christ and the commitment we have. But then it's reflected. In other words, it's a response. It's, it's something that other people are going to see. It's reflected by, and, and we don't have it here, but our, our church sort of mindset is the glorify, grow, and go. And so the glorify part of it would be daily walking a surrender, surrendered life to Christ. So we live our lives in worship, glorifying a God who's created us and what he's done within our lives. And then the grow part of it is that growth in the knowledge of God's word where we're digging into his word and, and, and we're, we're growing to, to become more intimate in our relationship with him. And then the response is, is the go part. And when you look at that go part there, it says boldly guiding others to a full and complete commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, as a church, how are we doing with that? That might be the big question. Because I think there are times when, when we are glorifying, we gather together every week for worship, and we maybe have other opportunities to do that. Uh, grow, we're, we're trying to provide programs and opportunities for you to get into God's Word and grow, but... Do we do as good a job as we should with the go? Do we think, well, I'm glorifying, I'm growing, that's good enough? Well, when we look at this passage today, and as we talk about it over the next several weeks, we're also called to go. Jesus commanded his disciples to go, and he's commanding us to do the same thing. And so it becomes part of our responsibility as we walk in that relationship with Jesus Christ uh, to, to lead people and, 
and allow people to grab hold of the fact that Jesus is Lord and he's Savior of all mankind. It's scary. And sometimes it's hard. But it's a call that he's given to us. Now, as he left this command, there's a couple things that we can do that will, at some point, maybe become foundational to help us to be able to share that gospel message with others. They're not real complicated, but they will help us with the ability to be able to not be afraid when a door opens or an opportunity arises to talk about Jesus. In Matthew 28, 18, it says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In Ephesians 1, 18 through 21, we read, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And in his incomparable great power for us who believe, that power is the same as, as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And then in Hebrews 1, 3, and 4, it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So one of the things we can grab hold of in all these verses was that Jesus is in a position of authority. That Jesus is in control. And so when we talk to someone else about Jesus and who he is, what we are able to hold on to is that Jesus has the ultimate authority in how that conversation is, is going to play out and, and what it's going to look like. And, and because he has that ultimate authority, what it does is it takes the pressure off of us. Because often when we go and we have conversation with someone, our fear is maybe we're going to fail or, or we're not going to do as good a job as Jesus would want us to do. And yet, what, what we can be reminded here is that Jesus says because he is who he is and we are who we are, as long as he's alongside of us, it doesn't matter because Jesus has the authority to take whatever we say and however we do it and make it become such that that person's heart will be stirred to come to know him. It takes the pressure off of us. We are called to, to sort of be that instrument, to, to take those steps, but we can find confidence in knowing that Jesus is there to come alongside of us. Jesus is there to, to sort of take control of whatever it is that ultimately the, the Holy Spirit has prompted us to do. Because of that, we're able to trust Jesus with the situation. And because of that, we can find encouragement in knowing that the pressure's off me because Jesus is the one who will grab hold of it. I mean, in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, it says, And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. As, as Jesus is having this conversation with Peter, he's not saying, Peter, build my church. He's, he's saying, Peter, on, uh, on you I will build my church. He's saying, I will use you, but I am ultimately going to do the finishing work in all of this. And it's a reminder to us when we are, are willing to go out and, and share and proclaim that gospel of Jesus Christ, that he's going to use us, but in the end, he is building that individual to come into that relationship with Jesus Christ. The authority rests on Jesus, and not necessarily on our skills or our words, it is the power of Jesus. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, 
God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. In all things, God works for the good. So even though we are afraid we're going to mess it up, even though we're afraid we're not going to say the right words or we're, going to, we're afraid how they're going to respond, we can find a confidence and a strength in knowing that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Jesus will be glorified in it somehow in some way. And so despite what we think, or maybe how a conversation went with someone, Jesus is going to work it for good. The second part of, of what we can grasp is not only that Jesus is in control, but, but we also have a call beyond just someone coming to know him. In Matthew twenty eight twenty, it is in teaching them to obey everything I commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. If you look at Hebrews 13, 5, and 6, it says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have, because God has said, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So we say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Jesus is there to help us in the process. And as we have that ability not only to grow someone into a relationship with Christ, we have that ability to continue to come alongside of them and move them to a point where hopefully they become a disciple as well that wants to go out and boldly share that gospel. And, and Jesus says, I'm there to help you. I'm there to come alongside of you. You know, it's always wonderful when you are scared, when, when maybe you're hesitant to have someone stronger around you. If you've ever been to a haunted house, you probably have gone with someone, and you probably find out very quickly who thinks the other one is stronger than the other one. You know, usually at a haunted house, you know, the one that is a little bit more fearful, I think this is why guys always like to take the girls, you know, because, you know, the guy's like, oh, I'll be the strong one here. And So what happens? You go through that haunted house, and, and the girl's behind him, and sort of like, protect me and keep me from being hurt, and maybe he's holding on to his arm, and... And, and there's that feeling of, there's someone stronger there, so I don't need to be near as scared. Maybe for some it goes just the opposite, where the guy's pushing the girl ahead of him, right? And, and he's like, protect me. And watch. But, but there's that mindset, when someone is alongside of you that seems to be stronger, it helps you when you are scared. And what does Jesus say in the scripture with? I will be with you to the very end. I'm going to be there for you. And so as we think about and, and, and you know, start to say, who can I share that gospel with? How, who can I tell about Jesus? Maybe we're a little bit afraid and, and we can have this image of, you know what, Jesus is right there with me. And as scared as I might be, I know he's going to allow me and help me to be able to say what I need to say. He's the one that we can hold on to. And he promises that he'll be with us. Now, as we finish today, I want to lay out two challenges for you for the rest of this, this series. And even if you're not here in the coming weeks, a challenge just to lay out to you in regards to your ability to be able to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first one is this. Just simply make a decision to want to be obedient to this command from Jesus. You know, he commanded us to go. And just, it, 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 it's not necessarily simple, but just to say, all right, God, I'm going to open myself up to go where you call me to go. And it's not to another country, it's that going. When I go out into the world, open up those doors. Like I said yesterday, I had a couple opportunities to do that. It's a matter of being open. You know, one of those, um, I don't know, I can't remember if I prayed about it in this service. I did, um, I did uh, in the first service, but uh, there was uh, a boy who was injured in, in a horse accident over at the fairgrounds yesterday. And when I was at the hospital with these girls, um, I noticed in that emergency room where, where he was, uh, there was a mother and, and a friend or whomever that was with him, and they were by themselves. And I could have very easily looked at that and just said, you know what? I'm not dealing with them, I'm dealing with these people. But I, I felt like God was just sort of stirring my heart to just say, you need to go in and pray with them. 
I had no idea who they were. I don't know where they were faith-wise. But I, I walked at the door and I just said, you know, and you know you have to be a pastor. Maybe that's a good excuse sometimes. But I just said, hey, I'm a pastor and, and I see you're hurting here. Can I just pray with you? And they were like, we would love that. And just took the opportunity to pray. Now, where does it go from there? I don't know. But maybe that becomes the door to what Jesus is calling in terms of go. And we all have those opportunities. And so it's just simply making that statement that I am going to be obedient to that command that Jesus has called upon me. And it's not necessarily to knock on doors or, hang out or, hold or hand out religious tracts. It's just simply a decision to say, I will be obedient. And then the second thing is this, and that is pray. There's incredible power in prayer, but specifically this is a prayer that I would challenge you with. And that is you can find an assurance that Jesus is with you. You know, it's scary sometimes when those, those opportunities arise. But just pray that you will have the confidence and assurance of knowing that Jesus is there with you. And so when that opportunity arises and, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. Should I open up that, that doorway and have this conversation or not? You know, if you're lifting up that prayer, Jesus will give you the confidence to say, I need to do this. And at the same time as you speak, you're going to go, I know he's right there alongside of me. So make a decision about being obedient and praying that you can find assurance that Jesus is with you. Now here's the beauty in it. You know, whether it's as individuals or as a church, you know, the reality of it is, is if we take this command seriously, if we take the Great Commission seriously, what we're going to discover, what we're going to, to, to find is that we will become a church ultimately that changes the world. So if we're committed to go, we can be a church literally that changes the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word on this day. God, as we sit here this morning, I know every one of us can think of someone that is a part of our lives that we can potentially share your wonderful message with. And for whatever reason, Lord, maybe we've been fearful, we've maybe been afraid, we, we, we are, are worried about what to say, and, and we hold back. And Lord, I'm reminded that we're talking about life and death here. We're talking about living with you for all of eternity or eternal damnation in hell. I, I, I always think of this image of Standing on the end of a dock, Lord, and there's someone in, in that water and they're drowning. They can't swim. And I think we would never just stand there and watch them. We would do something. We would jump in. We, we would do whatever it would take to be able to save that person from the death they potentially were going to experience. And, and in the same manner, Lord, how often do we have people around us that are spiritually drowning and all we're doing is standing there? And when we do, I, I just pray that you forgive us. And yet at the same time, Lord, I pray that you will uh, just stir our hearts in such a way that we will know that we need to do something. We need to jump in. We, we need to tell them about Jesus. We need uh, to, to just open, open up and speak the words and, and do the things necessary so that they might see you. And be able to maybe come into that relationship with you. And that together, that person and ourselves might be able to experience the complete joy that comes from a new life in Christ. As we go through this series, Lord, I pray that you will reveal to us individuals each day of each week where we will have that opportunity and then give us not only the boldness to proclaim, but give us the assurance that you're there alongside of us. Thank you for your words on this day to go. Push us to do that. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus.